Hello and welcome to this video lecture on global public health policy. In this session we're going to look at and discuss how global and international health policy is made. We're then going to talk about what kinds of global policies are developed, who are the key stakeholders involved in the policy making process at the global level and what the current key global health problems are. Just a reminder, yellow slides are key slides. They're useful for thinking about the assignment. So let's start with the global policy making process. The policy making process that we've discussed in previous video lectures applies to global public health and the international context. So the same policy process model that we've looked at before applies to global health policy making. The same theories and models such as Kingdom's three streams model also applies to global public health. The key differences between national and global policy making is that there are many more stakeholders involved, hundreds of stakeholders across the world. The issues and the interventions that are developed as part of the policy making process are more complex and all the actions can only happen with the cooperation and agreement of national country governments. So what are some of the key global health policies? Global health policies can be broken down into a number of aspects. International Development Goals, we used to have before 2000, the Millennium Development Goals, and they were then developed up into the Sustainable Development Goals, and we will talk about them briefly a little bit later. There are also international commissions, and the most recent one has been the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. And again, we will talk about that a little bit later. And there are also global health promotion conferences and charters, statements, declarations and recommendations. And again, we will talk about these a little bit later on in this video lecture. Lastly, and most importantly, the United Nations develops treaties, conventions, protocols, declarations and agreements. And these are signed up to by country governments. These are all voluntary agreements and countries are able to back out of them, to withdraw from them or not sign up to them in the first place. The key ones that we can think about in relation to health are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Declaration of the Right to Health and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So I talked about development goals. Currently there are 17 development goals, 169 targets and a range of activities and actions that are taking place currently in relation to these development goals. The majority of countries around the world have signed up to pursuing and achieving the sustainable development goals and these are to eliminate poverty, to eliminate hunger, to increase and enhance good health and well-being, to increase and enhance high quality education, to achieve and narrow the gender inequality gap to increase and enhance clean water and sanitation and their access, availability and affordability, to increase 
the amount of affordable and clean renewable energy to provide decent work and economic growth, to have sustainable industry, innovation and infrastructure, and infrastructure in this context are roads, hospitals, food systems, agriculture, transport systems, and so on, to reduce inequalities, both social health and environmental inequalities, to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable, to increase the amount of responsible consumption and production, to take action on climate change, to protect and preserve and enhance life below the water, to preserve, enhance and protect life on land, to increase and enhance peace, justice and the institutions that enable peace and justice, and lastly to increase partnerships around these other 16 goals. These are quite ambitious goals and the aim is over the next 10, 20, 30 years for countries to move towards achieving or reducing the gaps between the high income countries which have generally reduced poverty, reduced hunger, enhanced health and well-being, are providing high quality education and have reduced gender inequalities uh, for those countries that have low and middle incomes. We don't really talk about developed and developing countries anymore or the first, second and third worlds. Some people still use those terms. A more objective and more neutral approach to thinking about this is as high income middle income and low income countries and the income relates to per capita income how much money on average people in those countries have uh, in a year as you can see if you want to look at the sdgs in more detail uh, the reference is given so please have a look at them and explore them The next key report is Closing the Gap in a Generation, Health Equity Through Action on the Social Determinants of Health. And this uh, report came out a few years ago. It was headed by Sir Michael Marmot and it looked at how, again, we can enhance, increase fairness and justice in relation to health across the world. Again the reference is there, please have a look at it. We don't really have time in this session to discuss it in more detail. Lastly, the ninth Global Conference on Health Promotion developed a declaration called the Shanghai Declaration on Promoting Health in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And again, the focus here is on health within the context of sustainable, environmental and urban and economic development. So who are the key global stakeholders? Well, they can be thought of in terms of five key areas international institutions such as the World Health Organization and the World Bank, international non-governmental organizations such as Oxfam, WaterAid, Save the Children and Greenpeace, international charitable foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, international businesses such as food and drinks companies like Diageo, Kraft and Unilever, and national governments, the high income countries like the UK, the US, Germany, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, the middle income countries like Brazil, India, China, Russia, 
and the low income countries like Ghana, South Africa, Ecuador, Vietnam and the Pacific Islands. Where can we find international statistics that can help to inform policy making at the global level? The first place to look at is the World Health Organization website. So if we type in WHO and we go to the World Health Organization website, we can see that we can find information on health topics. So if we were interested, for example, in malaria, we can go to M look up malaria and here we have an overview and a range of fact sheets and other information here i often find the fact sheets are very useful and generally go to them to have a look at what key information is available and as you can see here we can look at key statistics then we have look at symptoms who's at risk the disease burden around the world how malaria is transmitted how we can prevent it, which is very important for public health. And there's a number of methods here that are listed. And then at, right at the bottom generally is the key strategy or policy. And here it is. It's the WHO Global Technical Strategy for Malaria 2016 to 2030. The other thing we can do is we can get country profiles. So for example, if I wanted to look at Mali, I can visit the country overview page and there are some Simple statistics there. I could go to the Global Health Observatory for more country information, which I can do in a moment. But I just want to go down this page, first of all. And here we have a country profile and the report is being developed. Now these websites change uh, every one or two to three years and more information and more interesting ways of looking at the data are developed. What I often like though with these country information profiles that WHO provide is that we can get a snapshot of what the key issues are in a country. I usually go for the PDF versions of these reports rather than these versions. I'll just go to publications. This is also another interesting place to find key information. You have, every year the WHO produces the World Health Statistics, which is a compilation of key data from the 194 member states of the World Health Organization, and there is also a whole range of topics as you can see on the um, right hand side. Now let's go to the Institute of Health Metrics which develops the global burden of disease and we can look at
go right to the top where it says global burden of disease compare and you get these fantastic maps um, let's look at a world map and we can look at this is total cause of deaths across the world from all causes in both men and women and all ages as a percentage which is not that useful but what we can do is look at it in terms of HIV for example and that shows us where the hotspots are in terms of deaths in terms of numbers of deaths and you can see South Africa and in terms of percentages again you can see the southern parts of Africa are doing worse than other parts of the world now let's look at something that might be more common respiratory infections again you can see the map changes a lot in Africa and some in other parts of the world including for example the Philippines and in India and Argentina for example and then risks are really interesting you can do maps of risk factors so for example we can look at air pollution and you can see where the big risks are and you can see it's India and China uh, Nepal Bangladesh have and parts of Africa as well and then if I'm just going to move to this one which is the top 10 causes risk factors and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it to level three first two and then three and you can see here I will actually move it back to two it makes it a little bit simpler and you can see here that in 1990 the top cause of total deaths the percentage of total deaths was child and maternal mal malnutrition but that has really gone down over the last uh, 20 years 30 years and now high blood pressure is number one tobacco is number two which in 1990 was already high at number two and number three so they've increased dietary risks have also moved up air pollution is there so you can see over the last 30 years the issues are pretty similar in terms of the risks uh, that humans face and what are the top causes of or risk factors for disease and ill health you can see here low physical activity is down here at 15 it's now moved to 16 we also have sexual abuse here and bullying and again that's there that hasn't changed uh, we have alcohol use here and alcohol use there again hasn't changed very much I'm just going to leave it there this is is worth exploring it's really interesting the information and you do get a range of different types of visualizations I don't find this that easy to read but it is an interesting map of the causes of death related to air pollution so now let's move on to thinking about three key areas that affect public health globally we're going to start with globalization globalization is the intensification of worldwide social relations which link distant localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away and vice versa. Globalization as a concept refers both to the compression of the world and the intensification of consciousness of the world as a whole, 
both concrete global interdependence and consciousness of the global whole. Globalization is a process or set of processes which embodies a transformation in the spatial organization of social relations and transactions assessed in terms of their extensity, intensity, velocity and impact, generating transcontinental or interregional flows and networks of activity, interaction and the exercise of power. Now let's look at these three definitions and see what kinds of themes come out of them. So in the first one and the second one and the third one, we have the same word being used, intensification or intensity. So that's one of the key things that is important about globalization. The second issue is social relations, which links to the first definition and then also links in terms of talking about intensification of consciousness to the second definition and then to the third one again it says it explicitly the spatial organization of social relations and transactions so globalization is about the intensification uh, and the extent of social relationships that transcend national boundaries in the past, if we go back a thousand, two thousand years, the people we knew related to the people who lived within a mile or ten miles of where we lived and worked. Now, though, we have relationships, direct and indirect, with people across the world. They could, for example, be family, we could go and travel and visit those countries, or we can buy goods and services that are made or developed in those countries. This means that what happens in other parts of the world, such as economic recessions or economic problems that happen, for example, in China, can have an impact to us here in the UK. Secondly, it means that people around the world and countries around the world can have power to affect us in this country. For example, if their companies move to other countries because they have cheaper and more highly educated employees, then it is likely we are going to lose jobs from this country and they will migrate to other countries. We can also have issues such as larger countries dictating and exercising their power on poorer and more vulnerable countries in terms of telling them what they should do how they should act and the kinds of trade and political and diplomatic structures, relationships and institutions that they should have. Lastly, the key aspect that comes out of these definitions is about interdependence. Again, in the first definition, it's about local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away. In the second definition, it talks directly about interdependence. And in the third one, it talks about extensity, the extent of the relationships we have, the intensity, the velocity, the speed with which things happen. For example, news and issues that happen in one country here, have a domino effect and impact on other countries and the flaws and networks both economically both socially culturally and in terms of our effects on the environment
Historically, there has always been some level of globalization, from the ancient seafarers who first traveled the Pacific Ocean, to international sea trading in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, to the global trade in slaves and the creation of colonial empires. All of these can be argued to be part of a process of globalization that has been going on for the last 2,000, 2,500 years. And examples of a European colonists and empires are Alexander the Great and the current one, the British Empire. And we can look at, it, while the US does not have a formal empire, its power does radiate outwards and they do have a strong influence on other countries in the world. In terms of Asia, we can think of Genghis Khan and his uh, uh, move from China and Mongolia in the first instance across towards uh, the West. And then China also had an empire and so did Japan. And in Africa, we th can think of the empires that formed around Ghana, Mali and Songhai. And in the Middle East, we had the Arab Islamic empires, the Ottoman Empire and the Persian empires. And in South America, we had the Incan and the Mayan empires. So what are we interested in about globalization from a public health perspective? Public health looks at the economic, social and cultural and environmental aspects of globalization and their relationship or affects on public health and well-being. Both positive and negative aspects for individuals and community health and well-being. So when we think about globalization, we're interested in the positives that come out of globalization and how they can enhance and improve health and well-being. For example, being connected through Skype or Zoom or FaceTime or other technological services, telecommunication services that allow us to talk to family and friends across the world have a positive impact on public health and well-being but the loss of jobs uh, the development of insecure lower paid lower quality jobs the potential for impacts and environmental impacts and disease impacts for example covid where originally it started in China and then through travel, international travel, it spread across the world. These are the negative impacts of globalization. We will look at this later in our apply session, but it's worth thinking about now. What does globalization mean to you? First, from a general perspective, a personal perspective, and then from your thinking of a public health professional's perspective. What are the key positives and negatives of globalization? Now let's move on to the second key global health policy area, climate change. Climate is sometimes mistaken for weather, but climate is different from weather because it is measured over a long period of time, whereas weather can change from day to day or from year to year. The climate of an area includes seasonal temperature and rainfall averages and wind patterns. Different places have different climates. A desert, for example, is referred to as an arid climate because little water falls as rain or snow during the year. Other types of climates include tropical climates, which are hot and humid, and temperate climates, which have warm summers and cooler winters. Temperate climates are similar to the climates we find in Europe and the UK. So what is climate change? Climate change is a long-term alteration of temperature and typical weather patterns in a place. Climate change can also refer to a particular location or the planet as a whole. 
Climate change may cause weather patterns to be less predictable, can make it difficult to maintain and grow crops in a region that relies on farming, for example. Climate change also has been connected with other damaging weather events, such as more frequent and more intense hurricanes, floods, downpours and winter storms. And it has also been implicated in the change in disease prevalence, particularly infectious diseases such as malaria, Zika, dengue, fever. What is causing climate change? The cause of current climate change is largely human activity, like burning fossil fuels, natural gas, oil and coal. Burning these materials releases what are called greenhouse gases into Earth's atmosphere. There, these gases trap heat from the sun's rays inside the atmosphere, causing the Earth's average temperature to rise. This rise in the planet's temperature is called global warming. The warming of the planet impacts local and regional climates. Throughout Earth's history, climate has continually changed. When occurring naturally, this is a slow process that has taken place over hundreds and thousands of years. The human influenced climate change of the last 100 to 200 years that is happening in, at an accelerated pace in the last 10, 20, 30 years is occurring at a much, much faster rate. So what are the health effects of climate change? Climate change affects the social and environmental determinants of health, clean air, safe water, sufficient food and secure shelter. Between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea and heat stress. The direct damage cost to health, that is excluding costs in health determining sectors such as agriculture and water and sanitation, is expected to be between 2 to 4 billion US dollars per year by 2030. Areas of the world with weak health infrastructures, with weak hospital and primary care services, mostly in low and middle income countries, will be the least able to cope without assistance to prepare and respond to climate change. What can we do about climate change? We can mitigate and adapt to climate change. Mitigation is about minimising and reducing climate change, particularly keeping the change in average global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Adaptation is about making people and infrastructure such as homes, hospitals, roads, public transport, agriculture, food distribution systems, water supply and sanitation systems resilient to the effects of climate change. That is, be able to cope with unpredictable weather and temperatures, including drought, crop failures and changes in the distribution of diseases such as malaria, parasite and the malaria mosquitoes. Some researchers argue that we are already past mitigating the effects of climate change and need to focus on how we will adapt to climate change. So, what do we mean by climate change mitigation? The key interventions around climate change mitigation are increasing sustainable development, and that is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It's about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides and ozone through improving transport, food and energy choices to reduce air pollution. Reducing our carbon footprint, for example, not using aeroplanes for international travel, not throwing away stuff after using it for a short time, not buying the latest gadget every year and moving to renewable energy sources and recycling more and reducing waste.
Moving on, what are the key climate change adaptation measures that we can think about and work on? We can move homes and key infrastructure like hospitals to higher ground so they are not affected by flooding. Where this is not possible, then we can make the ground and first floors able to withstand flooding and move people to live and move key facilities to higher floors so that the ground and first floors are floors where water can flow through and not damage the building and not damage property and not damage and uh, affect people. We can make buildings more weatherproof, we can use materials that can withstand extremes of heat, cold and flooding and we can develop agricultural approaches that can deal with changes in temperature and rainfall so that crops can continue to be grown and livestock can continue to be raised for milk, eggs, meat and leather. We will look at this example in the apply session but it would be worth you thinking about this now. If we were developing a, a policy on climate change for where you live, who would we involve? What would the content of the policy be? How would we develop the policy? That is, use the public health policy process that we looked at in the previous session and think about what we would do in each of those steps and think about what stakeholders and what people we would involve in the policy process. What social, political, economic, cultural, environmental and health factors would we need to consider in developing our climate change policy? Lastly, let's look at healthy and sustainable settlements, often also called urban health. Globally, more people live in urban areas than in rural settings. While cities offer many opportunities for employment and access to better services such as health, education and social protection that are important and necessary for good health and human development, cities can also pose unique health risks. In urban slums and smaller informal settlements, overcrowding and lack of access to safe water and sanitation contribute to the spread of infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, for example. Rates of non-communicable diseases, violence and mental illness are also often higher because of cities' social, built and food environments. Only 12% of cities globally reach air, water and soil pollution control targets. With such trends in mind, the World Health Organization has identified urbanization as one of the key challenges for public health in the 21st century. The importance of managing and planning urbanization in a way that advances rather than holds back health and health equity will only grow. By 2050, 70% of the world's people will live in cities. An example of a policy network or a program developed by the World Health Organization is the Healthy Cities program. And the Healthy Cities network in Europe is one of the most advanced. And this is worth having a look at if you are interested in urban planning and healthy urban planning and health in all policies in relation to uh, cities and human settlements, then this is a really interesting approach that WHO has developed where healthy cities sign up to make a commitment to pursue health and well-being as a key priority for their community. A healthy city is one that is continually creating and improving those physical and social environments and expanding those community resources 
which enable people to mutually support each other in performing all the functions of life and developing to their maximum potential. How do we become a healthy city? A healthy city aims to create a supportive environment, achieve a good quality of life, provide basic sanitation and hygiene needs, and supply and provide access to affordable health care. Being a healthy city depends not on current health infrastructure, but a commitment to improve a city's environment and a willingness to create the connections in political, economic and social arenas across the full range of stakeholders in these areas. If you're interested in urban settlements and the issues around urban environments, then the UN Habitat uh, website is a really a fantastic resource. And as you can see, Urban October, they are running a little program, 31 days of promoting a better urban future. It's a very interesting website worth uh, having a look at. Again, we will look at this in the apply session, but if we were developing a policy on making healthy cities for the World Health Organization to recommend to countries, who would we involve? What would the content of the policy be? How will we develop the policy? What social, political, economic, cultural, environmental and health factors would we need to consider? And lastly, what can we do to bring in aspects such as globalization and climate change into the discussion around healthy cities? Lastly, it's really important to understand the history of how policies have developed and historical timelines for policies. It can be quite boring. Historical listings of policies and dates can seem boring, but it is important to give a sense of how policy and policy priorities have changed and been influenced by stakeholders over time and the social, economic and environmental factors that have again influenced how the policy has been developed and how the policy has achieved or not achieved its aim and objectives. And this is an example of a policy timeline and this is a sustainable development policy timeline. The issue about how we can protect the environment and issues about how humans are impacting negatively on the environment started in 1972 at the Stockholm Conference. Then in 1980, there was a world conservation strategy. And then in 1987, we had the most important single report on this issue, the Brundtland Report, Our Common Future. And then in 1987, the WHO uh, started its Healthy Cities program. In the 1990s, we had a range of papers and expert groups on the urban environment. And then 1992, again, we had a very important conference at, in Rio in Brazil about Agenda 21 and then in 1993 we had a Sustainable Cities project in the European Union and then in 1994 again we had a very important conference in Aalborg uh, looking at the Aalborg Charter and Campaign and then as you can see we have had continued to have a range of activities related to sustainable development. In 1996 we had the first Habitat conference and then in 2001 we had habitat 5 and then more recently we have had urban environmental strategy statements and more recently as you can see through the sustainable development goals which are a key driver for sustainable development we are having the convergence the connecting of these key strands so globalization climate change and um, urban settlements are connected through uh, the sustainable uh, development goals 
This is just a list of the nine global health conferences that have been undertaken. And as you can see, we've had quite a few over the last 30 years, starting in Ottawa in 1986 with the Ottawa Charter and all the thinking around what is health promotion. And then we moved on to thinking about healthy public policy. So that has been on the agenda for a very long time, since 1998 in the Adelaide Conference. And then above that, if you see in 2000, we've been looking at equity. And more recently, we've now moved forward into looking at issues of how we can actually connect health and development and improve the implementation of policies. And lastly, we've now gone towards the connections across globalization, climate change, urban development to this holistic view of the sustainable development goals and health for all and all for health. Well, I hope this has been a quick overview that has been interesting for you and that you have found something that you can then follow up uh, with your own independent study. Just a reminder of what you should try and do uh, after every session. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you in the next session.